I'm Gene DeClerc, Professor of Community Health Sciences at the Boston University School of Public Health, and this is Birth by the Numbers. Hi, I'm Gene DeClerc. We're looking at Birth by the Numbers 2014. In this video, we're going to look at myth and reality related to cesareans in the United States. This is a project funded by the Transforming Birth Fund. Here's the pattern of cesareans over the last 20 years. In 2012, there were almost 1.3 million cesareans in the United States. What you can see in this pattern is a decline in the early 90s, followed by a rapid increase over the next dozen years, and then a leveling off in the last four or five years. Now, the implications of all of this is that something profound has been happening in maternity care in the United States. And we're going to explore the degree to which cesareans contribute to those changes in the U.S. maternity care system. This is that overall pattern broken down by race ethnicity. And what we find is that the overall pattern holds up for white and Hispanic mothers, but a change for black non-Hispanic mothers. In that early period when rates were going down in the United States, this cesarean rate stayed the same. When the rates went up, their rates went up faster than any other group. There's five common explanations that are used to explain the high rate of cesareans in the United States. One is that mothers are getting older and older mothers are at greater risk, hence more likelihood of cesareans. Second, that there's more multiple births, that with assisted reproductive technologies, there's more twins and triplets, and they require cesarean births. A third explanation, as we improve the health of mothers, babies may get bigger, but in turn may have more trouble being born, hence the need for more cesareans, the argument goes. Fourth, it's about the mothers. They're not as healthy as they had been, that there's more obesity, there's more diabetes, there's more hypertension. And last, mothers were asking for it, that part of the reason for the rise in the cesarean rate in the United States is because mothers themselves wanted more cesareans. Let's look at each one of these arguments in turn. First, older mothers. Here's the trend regarding older mothers in the United States. And what you see is, for a long period of time, there was a clear growth in the number of mothers over 30 and over 35 in the United States. So that part of the argument would hold up. The difficulty is that since 2003, Certainly for mothers over 35, there's been essentially no change. For mothers over 30, it's grown a little bit in the last few years. But let's look at cesarean rates by age, and you see a somewhat different picture. Now, there's a lot of numbers on this, which may intimidate some of you, but warms my heart. So let's look at cesarean rates by age. Here we compare 1996 to 2012. The red bars are 1996, the yellow bars, or bars, depending on where you're from, uh, for 2012. And what they show is a really interesting pattern, namely that the cesarean rate goes up by about 55% in each one of the groups. It's not all isolated among older mothers. Perhaps most concerning in this entire figure is the speed with which the rate went up among younger mothers, and given what we'll talk about later about the difficulty of having a vaginal birth after cesarean, the likelihood that those mothers will continue to have cesareans throughout their childbearing years. What about the second argument? that there's more multiples out there. Well, here's the data. Again, an increase for a long period of time, and then a leveling off for the last half dozen years. What about the cesarean rate for multiples? Here you see the same pattern again, that what's been happening is not so much a vast increase in multiples, but a change in the behavior regarding births of multiples. More cesareans. What about the third argument? It's a very seductive argument. Babies are getting bigger. We think we're more healthy. Bigger babies might have a great difficulty being born. It's a very logical argument, except for the fact that it's completely wrong. The difficulty is this. Babies aren't getting larger. They're getting smaller. These are the birth weights at the two highest ends of the birth weight spectrum for singleton births. So we took out the twins, which tend to be smaller anyway, and look at the pattern over time. In fact, babies aren't getting bigger at the higher end. There's fewer and fewer babies at that higher end. So that's not much of an explanation. But let's look at the cesarean rates by birth weight. And what you see is an interesting pattern. When the rates went down in the early 90s overall, the rates at these birth weights also either stayed the same or went down through this period of time. When the rates started going up, the rates at all the birth weights started going up. And when they leveled off, they leveled off for all the birth weights. What about mother's health? I'm always a little leery about explanations that focus on mothers being the cause of the problems. So let's look at some of the data. One argument is that we have more obesity in the United States. And obese mothers are at greater risk, hence the need to do more cesareans. Well, here's some data on that. 
The data aren't completely comparable. The first three bars, uh, 2003, 2006, and 2009, are from the same data source. The 2011 one is slightly different. These are not all states. This is the best at the moment we can do to chart body mass index, which is how we measure these things. And what we find is a slight increase in the early part of the 2000s and more or less a leveling off more recently. What about cesareans by different weight classes? The pattern is striking. That as a mother's weight increases, the likelihood of a cesarean increases substantially. But yet again, what we see is a bigger difference in the practice associated with the particular condition than we see in the particular condition. What about diabetes and hypertension? These aren't the best measures we have. They're a little crude, but the pattern is still pretty clear. A clear growth in diabetes and hypertension among mothers either before they're pregnant or during their pregnancy. What about cesareans for these reasons? Once again, same pattern. In the early 90s, a decrease, and in the period since, an increase. What about the argument that this is about maternal requests, that mothers are pressuring their providers to give them a cesarean? So have maternal request cesareans contributed to this? Let's take a look at the data. In a national study of mothers called Listening to Mothers, they were asked a series of questions related to maternal request. And the criteria that was used is this. A maternal request primary cesarean, first time cesarean, had to meet two standards. One, the mother had to have asked for it in advance, that this was something that didn't happen during labor but happened prior to labor. Secondly, it had to happen for a, a non-medical reason. If it's a medical reason, it's not maternal request, it's a response to a condition. So the question is, how many of the primary cesareans that were studied met those two criteria? And the answer is a resounding 1%. In 2005, when listening to mothers ask mothers those questions, it was about a quarter of a percent. When the same questions were asked in 2011, it was a little more than 1%. So does that mean maternal request cesareans don't exist? They absolutely do. You can see the quote on the slide, and it indicates a mother who quite clearly had a maternal request cesarean. But the reality is this is rare. This is exceedingly rare, certainly not enough to drive the kinds of increases we've seen in the cesarean rate. It's not just this one study. Studies in Canada, England, and the U.S. states have all confirmed very, very low rates of maternal request cesarean, using what I think are very fair questions to try to get at this phenomenon. There's another side to this. Mothers were asked if they ever felt they were pressured to have a cesarean, and you see the results in this figure. Interestingly, upwards of 20 to 25 percent of mothers felt they were being pressured by their providers to have a cesarean, which flips the whole argument on its head. Instead of mothers pressuring their providers to have a cesarean, mothers feel like they're being pressured to have a cesarean, particularly if they choose to have a vaginal birth after cesarean. So there are five reasons that have been cited for the rising cesarean rate. Let's go through them one at a time. Are mothers getting older? No. Are there more multiples? No. Are babies getting bigger? No. Notice there's two exclamation points to drive that point home. They're not only not getting bigger, Babies are actually getting a little bit smaller over time. What about maternal health? Does that contribute to it? Yeah, some. You can't deny that. Uh, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension are all going up. Uh, different studies, different rates, but they're all going up. Although in the case of obesity, it seems to have leveled off in recent years. What about maternal request? Definitely not. So this brings us to another question then. If the usual explanations for the rising cesarean rate don't apply, then what can account for it? The answer, practice changes. Changes in the way we do maternity care in the United States have contributed to this change. Now, let's go through a couple of things. First, these are the leading indicators for cesareans, according to a recent report put out by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. And the reasons they cite are labor arrest, non-reassuring fetal heart rates, what we used to term fetal distress, malpresentation, breech births, and multiple gestations. Well, let's look at the pattern of cesareans around these conditions over time. Here are the rates for four of the conditions cited back in 1990. Let's look at what happened to those rates over time. Now, remember the overall pattern, right? A decline in the early 90s, a growth after 1996. So let's look at 1990, 1996, and a more recent date. Here it is from 1990 to 1996. And what you see is, for those conditions, that are seen as the leading reasons for cesareans, the cesarean rate for all of those conditions declines in the early 90s. What happens between 1996 and 2011? They all increase rapidly. Now, 
What this illustrates was captured beautifully in the title of an article almost 20 years ago. The rise in the cesarean rate, the same indications, but a lower threshold. What's changing is not that mothers are changing nearly as much as the nature of practice has changed. So is there any other evidence that this is about the culture of practice? Sure. Let's look at some variations. By variation, we mean if you look at differences across institutions, hospitals, across states, any differences we find should be associated with any changes in the demography of those states or the population served by those hospitals. Well, let's take a look. Here's a distribution of births by state over time. I'm going to pause for a minute and let, let you see how this runs over the 20 years that we have data for. So here's the distribution of cesarean births by state in 2010. When you look at this figure, you must have the same thought I always have when I look at it. That looks considerably like the Democratic Voting Coalition in presidential elections back in the 1950s and 60s. OK, maybe that wasn't your first thought, but it was mine. And I looked at that a little bit more. What if you took the states and split them at the median for cesarean births in the United States? This is what you'd get. And I colored the states that were above the average rate blue, the ones below it red. Then let's look at the vote for John Kennedy in 1960. And this is what you find. Not a perfect match, but a match among more states than less. So let's go back and forth between those. Take a look, and you see the differences are not that great. In fact, if you put the states on a scattergram, which is the next step I know you were about to take, you get this pattern, a positive relationship between the vote for John Kennedy in 1960 and 2012 cesarean rates. Now, this is what we would term a spurious relationship. But the point of it is this. Nobody says that the vote for John Kennedy in 1960 was based on the age of mothers, the size of babies, the health of mothers. What they say is voting is about culture. And the point of this is, so is birth. We're talking about a cultural phenomenon when we're talking about cesareans, not just the medical phenomena. Now, variation isn't just at state levels. It's also at the hospital level. Here's a quick look at two sets of data around hospital births. These are the rates of cesareans in hospitals in Massachusetts from 2004 to 2006. And what you see is a wide variation overall. Now, if you brought that data to a hospital, they'd say, you didn't risk adjust it. That we deal with a riskier clientele than those other hospitals, that must be the reason why we have a higher cesarean rate. So some analysts, I was one of them, did just that. And we looked at the lowest risk births we could find. And this is what happens to those variations by hospital. They actually increase. The rates go down, as they should, for this lower risk population. But the variation is actually wider overall. Now, how does this happen? How does a culture of intervention occur? One way to look at it is through what's termed the cascade of interventions. So let's take one look at it. This is data from listening to mothers in 2011-12. And what you see is a somewhat complicated pattern, but I'll try to make it clear. So we looked at first-time low-risk mothers to see how this pattern would emerge. The first question we asked was, did they have an induction or not an induction? And to the left, you see the mothers who had no induction. To the right, you see mothers with an induction. Then we asked the question, did the mother have an epidural or not? If you follow the path down the left side, what you see is for mothers with no induction, no epidural, the cesarean rate was 5%. For mothers with the induction, with an epidural, the rate is 31%, six times difference, among a roughly comparable population to begin with. Does that mean induction and, and epidurals are inappropriate? And the answer is no. There's certainly going to be cases where one or both are necessary. But the implications for what happens as a result of those are profound. And the likelihood of a cesarean varies widely according to which path you followed. Now, what about vaginal birth after cesareans? I know many of you are sitting there saying, when's he going to get to vaginal birth after cesarean? The answer is now. Here's the rate of vaginal birth after cesareans, once again, among lower risk mothers, full term births, singleton births, Baby is vertex, not breech. And you see the pattern. It's the overall pattern of a rise up until 1996 and then a rapid decline. But I just want to point out two things from this. 
One is, you see the major drop that's circled there. A study came out looking at induction in vaginal births after cesareans, and there was an accompanying editorial that called for an elimination, essentially, of vaginal birth after cesareans. And you see the very rapid drop in a two or three month period over time. Then you see that second study. It says Landon uh, from New England Journal of Medicine. That was actually the strongest study we have to date of uh, vaginal birth after cesarean. And what it found was there's a trade-off between repeat cesareans and vaginal births after cesarean. Note what happens after the publication of that. The rates continue to go down. It's not just about evidence. It's about evidence and more. How do we compare to other countries? We have the lowest VBAC rate, vaginal birth after cesarean rate, of any industrialized country in the world. Now, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists put out a bulletin several years ago trying to encourage more vaginal birth after cesarean. And they include in that a statement that mothers should be offered a vaginal birth after cesareans if they met certain criteria. So what happened to the VBAC rate after the report was issued? Look at the right-hand corner of this. The VBAC rate has gone up from roughly 8% to 9.2% in unofficial figures. Not much of an increase. The challenge is that for providers who don't want to do a VBAC, they're not necessarily going to have that changed by the issuance of a report. How do we see that? Here's some data from listening to mothers. We asked mothers in the 2000, 2005, and 2012 surveys if they wanted a vaginal birth after cesarean and were denied, what was the reason they were denied for? And what you see is between the 2005 and the 2012 surveys, in other words, before and after the issuance of the ACOG report, that being denied the opportunity to have a vaginal birth after cesarean because the doctor wouldn't do it or the hospital wouldn't do it decreases substantially, very much in line with what the recommendations were. But suddenly, the proportion of mothers who were told there was some other medical reason that they can't have a VBAC more than doubles in this period of time. It's very difficult to get people to change their behaviors in any realm. Now, does this mean a rising cesarean rate is inevitable? No, absolutely not. Why? Think back to the first figure. The United States has already leveled off. They're not going down, as some might want, but they've already leveled off. And it's not unique to the United States. Here's an indecipherable figure with more data than you could ever want. But the key to it is this. These are cesarean rates for comparable industrialized countries. And what you see is a pretty strong pattern that after about 2005, the rate of cesareans levels off in most of these countries. So there are concerns with this, and people are working to try to reduce cesarean rates. Here's one example. The American College of OBGYN and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine issues a report in March 2014 on how to reduce safely the rate of primary cesarean sections. Advocacy groups have worked very hard at this. The March of Dimes has launched a campaign to try to reduce prematurity by limiting inductions before 39 weeks to only cases with a clear medical indication. And it's had an effect. This is the rate of prematurity in the United States over the last 22 years. And you see in the last five years, a clear decline as a result of the efforts of March of Dimes and many other groups to try to reduce unnecessary cesareans, unnecessary inductions. Other groups are active. A number of states, here you see California, Massachusetts, and Ohio have formed some type of perinatal quality collaborative. And in it, they deal with issues as to how best to reduce unnecessary interventions. Here are some other advocacy groups that are working to try to reduce cesareans in the United States. Choices in Childbirth is a group out of New York. Childbirth Connection provides evidence-based resources for mothers who are contemplating a cesarean or a vaginal birth after cesarean. And then there's this site. I'd encourage you to come back to this site. We'll continue to update the data on these trends so you can follow along with them. We also have slides you can download to use if you're teaching or you're conveying this, or you simply go up to strangers in the street and you want to convince them with those slides, they're yours to use. Thank you for joining us. Keep looking at the evidence, keep questioning the data, and become advocates for mothers and babies and their families. Thanks.